social practice is a funny thing to dis- to really try to define. I think it's um, it's confusing for people because they get uh, they misunderstand. I think a lot of what the focus is. They get confused by subject and theme, uh, meaning there's some perception that the requirement of being social is simply enough to create meaning. And it's interesting to me because I don't think that's the point of social practice at all. I think it's the condition by which the work is made. It's the process. It's the gesture. It's, it's similar to how someone might have a problem understanding painting and they were very stuck in a world that had to be figurative and representational, that the operation of painting was more of a role of documentation, and it took the camera to destroy our imagination of the previous understanding of art, or in other words, our imagination becoming limer- um, what is called liberated in the way that art might be able to change the way you see the world. It's probably similar for social practice right now, that people really hold on to this idea that culture is manufactured in such naive terms. I don't believe that's true. I think social practice is actually more complex. It's uh, more critical and rigorous than one might perceive it to be on the surface. I also think it's something that often allows humor and joy to enter art in a way that hasn't happened often uh, in the history of the world. What's amazing about art to me is that it wasn't humorous and joyful until the past hundred years. And something happened around the world in the past hundred years where we realized that we could celebrate the joy in humanity as much as everything else. The uh, moral messages and ethics and these kinds of ideas that show up for thousands of years were quickly replaced by images of fantasy and folly and uh, reimagining landscapes and meaning and paint and things like that. I think social practice is in a similar position to maybe how we fractured this history a hundred years ago as a group of people. And it's taken a couple of generations for us to get to this place right now where social practice is in a lexicon and a vocabulary that's international. It's within a practice that is being uh, regarded seriously, critically, analytically, academically. And yet, for so many people, it's hard to define. It isn't. Participation is just simply not enough. That's a quote I was told today by an amazing curator. And uh, she simply said, participation is just simply not enough. There needs to be an intense more amount of agency and rigor within something for it to exist in this frame. It's the fact that we use strategies that we perceive as social that might include broadcast media, a lack of materiality, the idea of a happening or an occasion, the context in which something sits, the fact that there isn't a tangible material, that it might be something that's extremely enigmatic and uh, transient. It might be something that you can't even really document that uh, makes social practice this funny word that people use loosely and often uh, anchor in the wrong way. I guess one of the projects, I guess the only project I really worked on, I'm going to look at the big project, and that's called Fallen Fruit. I'm not going to look at a small project, because I actually believe everything that we do with Fallen Fruit um, intersects social practice. I, I don't believe the three of us, Austin Young, Mitya Spigner, myself, David Burns, I don't think any of us had any intention of making this project be social practice. I think what we did was we responded to someone asking if it was possible to make something that was inclusive. And so we looked around ourselves and we looked at our own family history and we looked for the truth and we found something that was within reach that we presented in a way that was honest and we were encouraged to keep exploring that topic. And over the past nine years, it has completely changed the way I see the world, not just the world that I walk through in a city, the world that I was taught to think about as much as the world that history shows me. I can imagine the history of a banana, which is our current favorite topic, because it's the only fruit that was sort of invented culturally. It was the first one, Um, first modern fruit. It's the fruit that was turned into a joke around the world. It's a fruit that has no class boundaries. It's a fruit that creates the largest amount of connections in food. 
as an object because it is not just the subject, but it is truly an object. The shape of a banana means a banana. That's not the same for rice or corn. And uh, it is the fourth largest crop on the planet. So this little micro digression is, is that it, it allows us to have a material base that creates a common ground where we can shift other things. I mean, we can so easily approach racism and classism, and it's not polarizing. It's simply a fact. And for us, that opportunity within this frame is maybe why people put us in social practice. I'm more interested in how we have the opportunity to destroy hierarchy, how we have the opportunity to really embrace the idea of inclusion. There's non-polarizing messages in everything we do. We can't represent the 99% because we refuse to let go of the 1% that would be ignored. It's simply not okay with us.